Well, welcome everybody to another BYU Library Family History Center Sunday class. We're uh, going to talk today about writing a history, a family history using AI chat. And it's this is an interesting topic. By the way, I'll say this a couple of times as uh, we go along. Uh, AI is changing dramatically every day. So writing a family history can be very difficult and very challenging. First of all, if you're actually writing a history of a particular family, you have somebody who has to have done all the research. And it's probably a very good idea that it's done very carefully with a lot of sources, because if you try to publish it, it will be available, at least to everyone that gets a copy of the published family history. And you want to make sure that you're not uh, uh, sort of... Uh, this the uh, object of a lot of criticism for for different mistakes that you've made. So it's kind of a well, you are actually getting into history, and people do have a lot of opinions about it. But uh, what I'm going to, basically, I'm not going to get into that kind of of, of difficulty. But uh, there are some things that have developed over the past year with artificial intelligence, which I'll call AI from now on. Uh, in order to avoid saying the words over and over again, that are very, very helpful. And despite some of the very negative comments that are being made about at the end of the world and people losing their jobs and things like that, uh, it's a tool, it's here, it's going to be used. And right now it's locked in a development race between Microsoft, Google, Apple, NVIDIA, uh, Meta, Adobe. Uh, and a bunch of other players. And so there's going to be comp like this competition on uh, who's going to end up being on the top of the AI development and uh, world is uh, something that's going to keep driving changes and dramatic changes and new people coming in and all that for the next uh, foreseeable future. So we're in a, a very interesting time in the development of computer programs right now. Well, first is my suggestion. You really should consider using artificial intelligence or AI tools for, for assistance. This a general suggestion. It's not something that is, if you know how to do a Google search uh, and you've done Google, you've been searching on the computer for things. I mean, if you search for well, you know where to go out to eat dinner or things like that on a kind of a regular basis, and you also do some real... Uh, searching on the computer for genealogical records and things like that. But there's no big step to going to using AI. All you have to do is start switching over and start talking to the AI chatbot. So there's a couple of words that you probably need to know, and one of them is that, chatbot. So, and a chatbot is, uh, is the generic term for that computer program that you're talking to, whether it's... A, a Google program or a Microsoft program or one of the other programs. The two programs that are right now vying for leadership the most uh, aggressively are, are the ones I just mentioned, Google and Microsoft. Apple, uh, who should be in, the, in the, the race, has, for the time being, not put out any separate AI chatbots. So we don't know if Apple's going to do anything at some point in the future. It's not like them to get into, into that area, except for the fact that it's strange that it's Google has a online program, Chrome, which a lot of people use, and uh, Microsoft has Edge, but Apple has their own operating system, but hasn't ever gotten into the, so far into the uh, world of doing searches online. So, the next step in this is, uh, as I go through, I'll try to explain some of this, the, all of the things that are the terminology, which, by the way, is not very large yet. You just might be surprised about how much help using Microsoft Copilot can be for a project like creating a family history or writing a family history or developing a family history. 
and I'm going to show some other ways that it can be affected and how how it will probably continue to develop in the future. So this was originally released as Bing Chat, and now it's called the Microsoft Copilot, and that's their final name change iteration of how they're going to designate it. And if, for, if you're using a PC, Windows computer, Windows 11, the newest updates of Windows 11 are going to be integrated with Microsoft Copilot, which I'll just call Copilot. And beyond that, uh, they're going to actually take the Microsoft computers, the physical computers that they sell, and the Microsoft keyboards are now going to have a separate key for the Copilot. So if you just push the Copilot key and get right to this screen right now, all you have to do is when you're looking at, at the Microsoft Edge program, and the, there would be a little Bing icon and that little Bing icon takes you to the Copilot. So, and that's appearing almost every place on, on uh, Microsoft's program now. And Microsoft, just for information's sake, if you happen to have been reading the news about it and learning a little bit of what's going on, uh, Microsoft Copilot uses OpenAI ChatGPT and the latest latest version of that. And uh, it, it has a Microsoft Image Creator, which is the image creation portion of Microsoft. And it uses Dolly 4, which is uh, actually a subscription program if you do it any other way than going through your Microsoft. And some of the features that you, you uh, uh, can get from Microsoft are incorporated in the Edge program that you can download on either a Mac or a PC but many of the advanced features are only available if you have a, an, a Microsoft 365 subscription for Word and, and PowerPoint and all the Microsoft programs. So it's part of the Microsoft group of programs and they've put all the different Microsoft AI things into all of their programs. But in order to get those AI function features, you actually have to pay a an annual subscription fee right now. So there is there is a paid version of, of most of these types of programs. And as I said, just the beginning, AI is changing every week. So you're not going to see the same thing. I did this presentation a couple of weeks ago. And when I looked at it uh, yesterday, and day before yesterday, I had to go through and make some major changes. So that much change in a couple of weeks that I would have to almost rewrite this. You may also want to use Google Bard. It's also part of Google. All you have to do when you're on, if you're on a Chrome website, uh, is to type in bard.google.com and you'll bring up the Bard. Over the past few weeks, Google introduced BARD probably a few months ago. And initially, the response and my evaluation of it was that it was uh, uh, not nearly as helpful as Microsoft. And so basically, I went back and forth and I continue to do that. But Google understood that they were way behind and in and with Google has the resources and they basically put tremendous amount of resources into Bard and within a very short period of time it has moved into being different but very very helpful so when you're using these programs it's it's kind of going to be a reflection of your interests what you're looking for and what kinds of of searches you're making as to whether or not you get responses that you think are helpful or not. Now, first of all, before we go further, BARD is powered by Gemini, and, and uh, there's going to be a lot of references here that I don't have time in an hour to go into a long discussion about, or we would never get back to the issue of doing a, a, a family history. But it's a cutting edge language model, meaning that it's got uh, a lot of information and you have to realize that Google's been in business for a very long time 
their Google searches have billions and billions and billions of, of websites on, in their database. And uh, so they they're already have the information that they need to create one of these types of programs. I'm not going to try today to explain all the details from a programming standpoint and from the structuring standpoint of how all this works. All you need to know is that it works to use it. And it's just like a Google search. Uh, you really don't have to know all the details of how Google does a search. You just have to know how to put in the information and ask to put in the, the information you need. Now, this is the first kind of jargon thing that you need to deal with. The information or the sentences or questions that you use with AI tools are called prompts. So what you type into the question field on any one of these programs is generically called a prompt. So you're prompting the AI program to respond to you. And the difference is that they use what's called natural language processing. And what the natural language processing is, is that instead of coming back with a list of websites that you can use to look at, uh, and you then have to go in and do more more steps and more steps, the AI responses to your prompts are conversational. So you ask a question, it responds. You say, oh, I don't agree with that, or I don't think that's right, and then it'll respond, and you can get into a conversation with these things. Uh, so it's a little bit a different way. It's as if you had a very extremely expert, knowledgeable person sitting next to you who would answer your questions, but only to the exact question that you ask. So uh, you have to be creative and uh, learn how to use the prompts to get the responses, what you want to respond. And one way I suggest to get in involved in this and get started is to ask questions that you absolutely know the answer to. I mean, if, if you're in genealogy, how I do this is I use my great-grandfather's information from my great-grandfather who has 182 sources and and uh, biographies and I you know there's there's not much I can't ask and that I don't already know about about my great-grandfather and I'll get into that a little bit but uh, uh, by doing that then when I ask a question then I can tell if the AI program is responding back with actual responses, if it's correct, if it's accurate. What I can say is that over the last six or eight months, it went from imagination, the term they're using in AI is hallucinations, to actual helpful information. And the main thing that's happened over all this time period is that Nearly everything that comes through both Bard and Copilot is uh, footnoted. They'll give you the footnote to where it came from. So you're using a, a, a search that says this is the answer, and here's where the answer is found. So you can check everything. And uh, it may be Wikipedia, it may be whatever it is, but it's uh, basically a way to get beyond just the, the, the surface part of the responses to the prompts. And the interesting thing about it is that you're, you're essentially interacting with your computer using words and phrases. And if you ask questions which, let's say, don't have a high degree of, of difficulty in the sense of being technical or being very historical and you need to know the exact date or something, uh, and you're just generally asking something like, give me a, a recipe for uh, a souffle and give them what kind of souffle you want. And you'll have a recipe and you can keep asking for more recipes. You can do anything. In other words, when you're asking for information, you're simply, it's like you're talking to someone in a sense. And it's not a real person. There's nobody behind the, the, the screen, as they say. It's It's the computer. Uh, predicting the, the the way that the answer should come. And uh, let me just start out with this. You might get very frustrated. 
not because necessarily the information is not accurate or it's wrong, because it's a computer. And when you do a Google search, for example, uh, you might get five things that are that are relevant to what you're looking for and two million other responses. Well, are you going to go through all two million responses? No. But eventually, if you page through, page through some responses on a Google, they're so far off of what you originally intended to, to get information about that you don't even want to look at them. Well, uh, to a sense, you still have a, a portion of that type of of interplay that you have to have that you you're really dealing with a computer so uh, we had an old statement that we used to use if you want to talk to a if you want to use a computer you've got to learn how to talk computer language and you've got to learn how to address the computer and learning how to do google searches is a, is a skill and it's something you can only acquire after doing a few hundred thousand or a few thousand google searches and so if you're talking to an AI to AI chatbot, then you need to learn how the chatbot will imper. They're very literal and you have to be very specific about what you want and what you don't want. And so there's lots of things there to consider. So Copilot and Bard are essentially searching for information and can give you wildly inaccurate responses. Okay, so just know that it's not going to hit the dime if you basically give them something that's either too general or has too many uh, implications. If you ask a question where the word itself that you're using has 20 meanings in different contexts, then it's not necessarily going to choose the right meaning that you intended. So you have to be more specific. And when you do get a wild response, you can say, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. And then you'll get more towards the specifics of what you're trying to accomplish with the machine. And I would suggest practice using prompts until you begin to get a feel for how they work. I suggest that you just start with anything that you're interested. I mean, if you need to know the prices at your local supermarket. Now, one of the things that you're going to find pretty consistently is that the the database, the information that is that is being used by this particular chatbot may not include the information that you're looking for, especially if it's too new. In other words, if it's information that about something that happened this morning or that's that's happening right now uh, it may never get to the point of answering the question because it'll just say i don't have that information yet or i don't i can't give you an answer to that question and there's also more restrictions being placed on it there's obviously things that are unacceptable in our culture and society and that when you start asking questions about them you're probably going to get a I don't answer those questions response. And uh, I'm not going to get involved in that kind of thing because they're being writing these limitations into the system as they work through the prompts things. So here's kind of some suggestions for using the prompts. Now, why am I going through this? Let me explain the why of this. If I tell you that you should use AI to do a family history, I figure, well, I better show you how AI works a little bit so you know why I would suggest that. And so this is the question that I'm starting to go through to answer. And I have to start here because this is such a new technology. It's not like saying, do a Google search and you'll find this information. It's not that simple. So what I've been trying to say in other world language is be specific. A prompt like write a story, yeah, uh, you might get a story, but it may not be anything you have even imagined to want. So you need to have a context. You need to be specific, clear, and concise, and it'll help to generate more useful output. In other words, you'll get something when you ask for it if it's specific enough. Provide a context. Ask the ch chat bot to behave as if it were a person, a process, or an object can be an easy way to start generating better prompts. You can say, I want a response as you act like you're a five-year-old and you tell me the answer to this question. And then you put the question in. And so then it will take, 
it will actually take the position of answering like they were it was a fast a five-year-old and you'll get a computer's version of a five-year-old response so there's ways to say this if you say assume that i am or, or you are and I'll, i'm just making this stuff up but if you said uh, i am an expert in this particular area and i want responses as if you were an expert and had the certification in genealogy i mean you can start that way and and then it will re assume a different level of response define the output format it's how to what do you want and for instance with microsoft copilot you can ask for for images because you have microsoft's image creator program behind the chat box so you can say generate an image of whatever you're looking for an image for now a lot of the images that i've used here in this presentation and that i'm going to use in a lot of my presentations for uh, simply for the reason that these aren't copyrighted images and so basically uh, the supreme court of the united states has held that copyright law does not extend and the copyright office of the government has determined that they're not going to extend copyrights to presently to any ai generated images so i spend so much time looking for public domain images that i'm not using somebody's work and have to get permission or whatever and so uh, this has been a big boon to me because i do imaging all week long every week and that's my been my biggest one of my biggest tasks and now i'm really kind of very very much benefiting from being able to create an image by simply describing what i want to have the image show sometimes i get a little frustrated as i mentioned uh, because it just doesn't seem to understand what I'm thinking. Well, I have to say it better because it's they can't read my mind yet, I suppose. Okay, so the format is important. How do you want it to look? What do you want it? Do you want a table? Do you want a list? Do you want it in, in some kind of citation format? You can say, give me a citation for this book, and they would give you a citation. But if you wanted a MLA or you wanted a... a, a Tarabian, or you wanted uh, Chicago manual style, whatever, then you could say, give me a Chicago manual style of, uh, of citation for this book, and they would give you the citation. I mean, it's it's the kind of things where the it's just the, the, what you can ask for and what kinds of information you're able to, to get is just almost beyond comprehension. Uh, you think, well, what do you and you, if you're specific enough then it'll it, you know the worst case is it comes up and says i can't do that or i don't understand what you're saying okay use do and don't tell it what you want it to do and tell it what you don't want it to do and then it will do what you want it to do maybe and then it probably won't do what you want it to tell it not to do so you can say give me a table but don't give me a table more than 10 lines long and then it will only give you a table up to 10 lines long. So that's kind of the thing it will do. And so structure your prompts. Use good grammar. Use good language. Don't swear at it. Don't do anything that uh, you wouldn't do in a polite society. And define its role. Give it some context. Input data and then imply that, and then give it some instructions on the data. And I'll show you how that works. Use constraints. This can help avoid the chat box meandering away from the instructions into factual. So don't tell it not to, to make them use its imagination. So just going to switch now. We're going into the publications of a family history. And there's lots of different types and publications. And I'll run through them really quickly. And if the question comes up, is there a handout which has already come up, the answer is yes, there is, and you will get a copy of the slides, uh, which is my normal handout that we will put into our slide archive here on uh, the BYU Library Family History Center. There are lots of different kinds of publications, so let's get into the types of publications. You can do a photo book, okay? You can take all your old photographs and, and just create 
through there's lots of different uh, avenues for publishing photo books you can do a narrative something about a biography about some ancestor's life in the context of where they lived and when their family history books uh, straight books on the history of the family showing the origins of the family the development of it in a history from a history standpoint this family lived in the east and traveled to the west or they came from europe and they came to america and that's a family history book combinations with all sorts of books and for example, all the ancestors and descendants of a couple for anniversaries, a 50th anniversary book on the family and the family development. Ancestral family history, starting with a, with an individual or a couple and adding additional chapters for each descendant family. And then a collection of family traditions and their origins, a family tradition book, newsletters, uh, publications with uh, about for family members on recent events, discoveries, and stories, time capsules, snapshot of family as they faced the depression or as they faced the Irish potato famine or World War II or something. In other words, focused on that. Family organization books, family organizations, reunions, group activities, how to do all of those different activities, and a poster. Uh, visual representations of the family tree or other thing of family history. Now, as I sat down, did I think through this whole process and, and come up with each one of these? No. I asked Microsoft Copilot, give me a list of the types of family history books about a person's ancestry. And in about 10 seconds, I had this list. Okay, can you see some advantages in this? And do you see the fact that all of these are relevant and actually answer the question? When you begin to capture that idea, I think it's when you begin to see that we are moved into a, a completely different and move uh, and sort of um, almost you know there's the old statement from Arthur C. Clarke about any sufficiently complex technology uh, has the appearance of magic. So that's just a paraphrase of it. But so it looks like magic, but it's really it's really just a very, very sophisticated leap in how these programs work. The other thing that's important to understand is the responses you get from Microsoft Copilot and Google Bard vary over time. If you ask the same question again, you'll get a different answer. There's no firm something behind you that's like looking at a book or looking at a website that's right there typed out. The list will not always be the same. So subsequent questions, give me a list of the types of family history books about a person's ancestry, gave me five responses here, which are good and maybe additional information that I, that I need to take into account. But even with the exact prompt and switching from copilot to bard you may get different answers so there's the answer that the same prompt can give you different responses and the type of family history that you create or choose to create will depend on your audience and the kind of story you want to tell um, if you're writing a children's book one of the best uh, of these books was a series. One of the books in the series was I Walked Across the Plains, and it was a story of children who had come across the plains in the pioneer movement of the, the 1847 and, and subsequent years. And so there's very many ways. This is kind of a, an open topic type thing of, of the type of thing that you can do. Now, the picture that we're looking at is an AI-generated image. I didn't specify all the details. I ask a very general question and, and suggested this. And sometimes I'm uh, just like for this afternoon, I had I was testing one of the the new Meta Imagine program, and the first response to my prompt was amazing. I mean, it was just, hey, that's really good, and so. You never know what kinds of things that you're going to have. And 
just so you know, there are hundreds of thousands of family history books that have been published already. And it's a really good idea to make yourself aware. If you're in the process of wanting to do a family history book, it would probably be a good idea to look at a bunch of family history books to see what kind of book you like or what kind of format you like and what you thought was a good way to write a book. Uh, you may have some of these in your family. That's entirely possible. I, When I was a child, I was very familiar with the fact that we had two or three of our books in my father's library that were about our family. And I always like to go through and look at the pictures and and read. This is not what made me into a genealogist, but there was that in my background. And one big collection that's very accessible and free is the Family Search Digital Library, which is now the book section under the search, uh, search uh, tab on Family Search. And there, at the last count, were over 500,000 books in that section. In fact, when I asked for a, research, a search for family histories in the book section on familysearch.org, uh, I ended up with 579,036 books. So there's quite a bit in there. Some of them are copyright protected. A, a significant portion of them are copyright protected. And whenever you run into a copyright protected per, uh, book on Family Search, I would do a regular search on the internet for other copies of the book that may be available outside of the copyright. Okay, so both co pilot, and when I say that, I'm not saying you're going to violate anybody's copyright. The answer is that that there are libraries who can lend the books and you can go check it out for a period of time, and that may be possible from the book that's copyright protected on Family Search. Both Copilot and Google keep a record of all your prompts and responses. So if you're wondering what you said, oh, I asked that question two days ago and I don't remember what I got. Well, I would suggest that one of the ways that you handle this is open up a Word document or a, a word processing document and just copy the, the responses that you really want to, to save and paste them into a document. Start collecting. Actually use this as a source for your research for your project. And as you do that, make sure that you record that and start organizing it into the narrative that you ultimately want to create when you're writing a family history. So... For this particular presentation, uh, the idea that I was using was to focus on an ancestral history. It's called a descendancy book. In other words, you go back to the original ancestor who came to America or the original ancestor who was famous or the original ancestor, whatever it is that you're, you're interested in in your family. And in my case, I took the original Tanner who joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is basically a common ancestor to uh, thousands and thousands of the people here in the western part of the United States and throughout the world now. But this is a book that already exists. And so if I were practicing in a sense of saying, I want to learn how to do this, and I want to see how I can use AI to help me find and, and develop information. And my original suggestion uh, just a minute ago was that you start with something you know. Okay, so here we have a book. My question is, can I get information which would start me on writing the same book? And the question, of course, is you have to be careful that you're not using anything that's copyright protected. The biggest arguments going on over AI right now out there in the, the world community it, are over copyright. They're claiming copyright violations that AI used to, is using their book for the basis for their generations, and they're just copying the information. The answer is no, they're not, and there's two sides to that. But the issue will have to be eventually decided, and it, it will probably be decided in the courts and probably end up in the United States in the Supreme Court. So we're basically in a situation where there's a lot of that. So you're going to be careful that you're not using. And the answer here is that AI now on BARD and on chat and on uh, 
Oracle Pilot will give you sources. So you can check to see if it's copied the source. And it's just the same thing that if you were finding a source with a Google search, if you copy the source, you have what's called fair use. You can put in portion of the, the thing. Just don't copy the whole book or the whole article and make sure you give attribution and source citation to the actual original document, which is being supplied to you by AI anyway. One caution, and this is more on the, on the basis of what you're trying to accomplish, is that you may have chosen a person with too many descendants, so focus on a few prominent descendants and families, and that's what this book does. This book focuses on some of the prominent people who are direct descendants of, of John Tanner. Now you want to ask about the family. So here's the prompt. It's tell me about John Tanner's life, birth, 15 August, 1778, Hopton Ken, Kings County, Rhode Island, United States, death, 13 April, 1850, South Cottonwood, Great Salt Lake City, Utah Territory, United States. Okay, so that's that's the basis. And now it comes back and it tells me there's two people that fall into that rough category. And uh, interestingly, no, I already knew this, by the way, and this is the purpose. In other words, I'm asking a question that I know the answer, and I know who they're going to get confused about. There was a John Tanner who, uh, by the way, there's a really interesting book because he was stolen by the Indians and learned the language and married an Indian woman and, and was a guide and interpreter. And his story of the life, his life was published in 1830. And his name was John Tanner. And then there's another John Tanner, who's the one that joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that's his at the bottom. So then you can tell them, yeah, oh, well, the, your, the other John Tanner isn't the one I'm interested in. I'm interested in the one that's uh, the leading figure in the church. Okay, so that's the difference between the, this research with AI and an online search for resources consists in carrying on a conversation because you can say, now I want a little bit more. And so when I get that point, I can ask additional questions. But my suggestion here is you may want to use Google Bard. Both Bard and Copilot are valuable tools. And, and there's you may find you one like one better than the other, but it's always better to have both because you can play them off against each other. They give you a little more information in one and a little less information in the other. Then you can ask the other one about the information that's missing. Um, this the, the the amount of information that these uh, that these uh, chatbots have behind them is is mind boggling. It's into the billions and billions. And now there's uh, the they're called large language models, and the large language models are into the, up into the trillions of entries. So they're unimaginably large collections of language and, and have the search engines behind them in addition to that. So here's an outline of John Tanner's life. And going through all of this, it's very, it's very accurate. And there's more detailed information at the bottom. This is basically a summary of what it says in the Wikipedia article, but it's in a format that gives you a basis for, for starting a, an article or a, a book about this person. And then you can ask specific questions. And so with this kind of outline, you know, you're, you're in a good position to, to move forward with your project. So go ask Microsoft Copilot and say, give me an outline of his life in this one. And they'll come back and generate. And so there's the Copilot's version of the uh, information that you're looking for. In any case, you've now got a kind of a structure for an article. And so you'll get, you'll get your ideas from both of the chat box. Now, at the same time, you may be doing a Google search because you don't know who all these people are or whatever. But if you're using the AI chat bot, then why not ask it the information that you're talking about? Like, tell me about Hopkinton, Kings County, Rhode Island, and when did it start and who settled it? Bing bong, the answer. About his Baptist church uh, connection. I mean, you can assume that, the, I better put this positive, 
you can assume that the chat bot knows everything Google knows about the world. So you're asking somebody who probably, or something that probably can keep answering your questions. So whenever you get a response like this, you can't take it on its face. If I didn't know anything about John Tanner and I got this, I would be wondering if all this was actually true. Did he really have 14 children? Did he have 10 and 14 children? Uh, he had 14, 21 children from three wives and 14 lived to adulthood and all that. But is that all correct? Uh, and since it's now giving you footnotes to all the information, it's pretty fast to check that. And and you you're you're ahead here because you have a narrative. You don't have to start writing all this because you've already got a way to start it, and and work with it. Now there's a big issue going on in schools about students using this. They have uh, issues with with the chatbots passing the bar examination for attorneys and passing the medical examinations for doctors and and doing things like that. Uh, the answer is the information is not faulty, but there are some concerns because they're doing things that basically we would like the people to do. But if you're writing your own story and you're doing your own project and you're not in school and no one's going to be be wondering about the information that you got, this is not copyrighted information at this point because it's been generated by a chatbot. So you're basically... Uh, have to use your discretion as to what you can use and what you can't use. But as an attorney, for example, of 39 years as a trial attorney, we had volumes of forms. I had a whole set of books. I don't know how many volumes, probably close to 100 volumes. And it was just nothing but forms. And when we, instead of rewriting a document, for instance, a contract or a purchase contract or a a mortgage or any kind of document that an attorney might have to draft. I wasn't going to spend my time redrafting the whole document. I just pulled the form book off this, the shelf and copied all the form and filled in the parts that I needed. Well, this is essentially what you're getting from a chat box. You're getting a form. You're getting information that, that the chat box finds and can be used to incorporate and, and build on for what you're looking for. So here's the sources I got from this particular question. And so what do I do? Well, I'm going to go look at the sources. I mean, you know, Wikipedia, obviously, but what else? Then you can go in and ask questions about what's already provided. It says that he was a chief financial backer of the Kirtland Temple. Well, what does that mean? What did he do? What did he do when he did that? So the question to co-pilot is, how was John Tanner a financial backer of the Kirtland Temple? And so the answer is, he played a significant role in the construction. And I'm not going to sit here and read this whole thing, but this is it. And there's three, three sources that it gives to this, to this information. And uh, one of the sources is very interesting, that the last one there is archives.library.byu.edu. That's the library special collections library. Hmm, interesting. It happens to be downstairs, the low, lower level below, below us in the uh, BYU Library Family History Center. So, James, yes. There's a question from Randy from Arizona. He says, how can you limit AI bots to look at a smaller corpus of information or subjects rather than the entire internet. Ask it to look at a smallest corpus of information or what you're intending it to look at. Tell it to look at a library, a book, an article, or whatever it is you're looking for. Just be specific. I'll show you because we're going to get there real quick and I'll give you an example of it. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so why is this interesting? Because this is documents in the library that I happen to be in. And I didn't ask for this. I mean, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know I had this stuff downstairs from me in the library. And so this is kind of a, well, good. Hey, here's something. And I'm now into original source material. And so basically, uh, there's 
uh, you can see I've jumped from being kind of nebulously interested, and now all of a sudden I can get into something that may be unique and uh, uh, something that may give a hook to and more more interesting uh, things for my project here. So you can always keep asking it. You can ask it topics, correct grammar, find additional information, and so forth. But let me start showing you some, I'll show you some lists here, maybe I'll give you an idea. So here's some resources generated by Bard about John Tanner, so you can understand. And I'm going to kind of run through this list real quick, and you can see how many more things there were from the information. And so you can start asking about it. So you can continue to ask questions. You can make comments. You can ask for summaries. For example, if I had a whole book, they handle that much information. As long as that book was digitized and available online, you could ask that question. You could say, give me a summary of that particular book that's digitized and online. And, and then it'll go through and give you a summary of everything in the book. And that's not part of this presentation, but some of the other presentations that I'm going to be doing on AI. I'm doing three live presentations at Roots Tech, and they may all be in the same day. Right now, it seems like the schedule says the opening day on Thursday of Roots Tech, I'm doing three one-hour presentations in the afternoon. So I'm the whole day or the whole afternoon talking about AI. So basically, you can take uh, a will, for example, and say, give me the names of all the people mentioned in the will, their relationships to the testator, and all the, the devisees, and how much they got, and what they got. And it'll go through that document and give you all that information. I say, okay, now put it in a table so it's organized, and they'll put it in a table. When you start investigating and seeing the responses and, and how it can happen, that's why it's important kind of to learn a little bit more and get some perspective. Because when you understand this is kind of what it can do, then all of a sudden you're saying, oh, I can see a lot of uses for this. I know where I'm going to use this. And uh, recently I put in uh, Tvard, for instance, I put in the headings to a uh, German record in black letter, Fakur, Faktur, German black letter script. And I said, uh, the heading, I said to Bard, transcribe this for me and translate it into English. I just dropped the image, the scanned image of the, of the German parish register into Bard and said, give me the translation of this heading in English. Think I had the translation of the headings in English. Okay, when you start to understand the power of this, of what we've got here, it's just absolutely remarkable. And please don't reduce it all to paper. Just start using the computers like they're computers and start putting your information into and organizing it and doing it on a computer. And just back up things. If you're worried about losing stuff, just back it up. But please get past the paper. James. Yes. There's a question from Carmen Went, and she wants mm -hmm. to know can, can AI read handwritten documents? Like I'm I'm assuming maybe she's talking about Yes. The answer to that is is definitely yes, they can read handwritten. Uh handwriting recognition has been developed over the last few years into a very sophisticated right now. Family search in the last two weeks has done millions and millions of documents from uh, Spanish-speaking countries in and, and uh, index those documents through handwriting recognition. It is not down to the consumer level yet, but I found that, that Bard actually could transcribe some of the handwriting. So it's going to get there very rapidly. Just It's just the computer power that it takes to do handwriting recognition is, is a little bit beyond our network and our computers home computers right now. So that's going to change that change by next week. Who knows when that'll happen, but it'll it's already there and uh, the techniques are already there. So yes, the answer is it's going to happen. I guess the question is and I'm going to have to end real quick here is that was that did it, did it have examples and things for, because my person was famous 
And so I took someone who, who definitely was not famous. And the answer is yes. The answer is definitely yes. If there's nothing out there on that person on the internet, or if it's buried in different documents, you may have a more, more difficult time finding it. The question also is asked, if you ask that information, then you've got some very specific things. In this case, one thing that I did not know, and here was his thing called Saints by Sea, and it's a, it's a ship manifest. It tells the ship he was on, and this was accurate. Specifically, he told me exactly when he came, and I just had never asked that question. So basically, that was helpful. And it also gave me all the other people who came with him. I would say at this point in time, AI chat is not particularly good at doing genealogical research. So you're not going to be using it to find your lost ancestor. I think the record hints, which are based on AI, are much more useful. But once the chat bots begin to incorporate the AI, then you really have uh, uh, something that's going to be powerful for search. And the first part of this has already been done. My heritage has AI search on the website for all of the information that they have in their 20 billion plus records. James, um, Judith Crispin yes. has a question. She wants to know if you have to have a paid subscription to Microsoft Not to use Copilot. Since I already have a paid prescription, I don't know what happens if you don't have a Microsoft 365. That's Word and and all of those programs. But it's part of the Edge browser, and I'm assuming part of that is included with the as the browser. Google's Bard is just Bard; it's free, so you can start with that. There's one last question. This is okay. from Kristen Patterson, and she says, can I type in facts and then have it write a creative way of presenting those facts? Absolutely. Anything you can imagine, it will do. You may not like it, but it'll do it. Yeah, oh. it's it's amazing. I mean, it, you just got to try everything you think of. Well, can it do this? You know, how about giving me a name for my dog that I just bought? Give me 20 names for my dog things like that. I mean, it's just, you do crazy kind of inconsequential things. But what I'm trying to say here is you can do actually serious things that you would be normally involved in. One last question. This is from John Fisher. He says, will AI translate a handwritten script document like a German marriage record and translate it into English? Many not yet. Of not yet. Okay. It can do all the type part of it. The, the, the black letter factor, which is the name of black letter, F-A-C-T-U-R. And many of them, but I'm expecting that to happen like in the next week. No, you know, very shortly, people will start using, they'll, they'll start incorporating and reading handwriting because they can do it already. It's already done. It is used by Ancestry to index the entire 1950 census. So it's there. It's just uh, hasn't been incorporated yet into any of the chatbots. But I did see part of the, of the when I put the document in, in German to Bard, I did see it translating some of the handwriting because it was plain enough that it actually read it. And so it read the names, for example. And that was interesting. So you never know when it's going to get there. Okay, this this first one, that's me. That's my photograph. Okay, so that's a real photograph from a real camera. Actually, my phone, you know, but it's a real camera. And this is an AI-generated photo. Thanks, folks. <laughs>